why do we get so upset when a car cuts us off in traffic? In the simplest terms, one reason is we can't see the person in the other car, so we kind of thingify them. If you could actually see the person in the other car, you'd probably be okay. When we think of a person, their personness, we think of their face. So for example, here's a photo of my wife. <laughs> okay, it's a photo of her knee and it doesn't quite work, right? The expectation is that the person is the face. Ah, oh, there she is. So faces are brilliant communicators of emotion, and emotion is powerful. I want to give the world a better face by putting a face on technology. But we have to be aware that faces can be very powerful, influential, emotional, and persuasive. I'm a digital human researcher at Sydney University, and I come from a background in the film industry. And I'm leading and part of a team that's working worldwide on producing photorealistic digital faces. And not just for the entertainment industry, for a wide variety of applications. And after years of research, I believe three things. That we are just at the edge of being able to produce reliably digital faces that you can't tell aren't real. That we can use these faces to help people like the aged, the, uh, the sick, and also better forms of communication. And that right now, we need to think about the ethical implications of our work. We give computers tremendous power when we give them a emotional dimension. Now, you might think as a computer graphics geek that I'd be happy enough just to come up here on the stage and talk about the tremendous advances in technology that have happened after decades of work by teams all over the world. And I am. I'm really excited. But when you've actually interacted with these digital people, these fake humans, you get to see how truly powerful they can really be. But before I discuss the implications, let me set the stage. Imagine you could deal with your computer and it would respond to you emotionally when you used it. Now, the way we interact with our machines is very different than the way we interact with each other. We sort of pod and poke our computers with our finger and our mouse. It's, it's passive and it's blank and it's submissive. There's got to be a better way. We all value face-to-face -face communication. In life, people will travel vast distances to see somebody face to face. You're programmed from birth to react to faces. Well, I want to put a face on your device. I want on your mobile voice assisted assistant. Why? Well, I like my phone, but I like you guys more. We're interested in being able to see if we can put a face on technology, because how would you react when a computer reacts to you with a smile? Would a six-year-old learn maths better if there was a six-year-old teacher on the screen? What about if it was a slightly older version of herself? Would a grandparent having a cup of tea be more likely to check in with a computer system if they didn't have to log in and type? They could just talk to a virtual agent that actually was somebody from their past. This is what we're excited to explore with digital humans. And this is why a team from around the world built Digital Mike. Hi, I'm Mike. Well, kind of virtual Mike, really. This is our Digital Human Project, which is a collaboration of a whole bunch of people coming together to produce, well, a virtual human. And not only a virtual human, but one rendered in real time. Puppeteered or driven in real time, rendered in real time, and not only that, but at 90 frames a second in stereo in VR. Okay, I'm forced to now say at this point that the reason that it's my face is not that I'm an egomaniac, it's actually that I'm just really cheap and I work for nothing. <laughs> okay, so how do we do it? So first we scanned my face. This allowed us to produce a very complex digital avatar of my head, or a digital puppet. Then with a camera mounted on a head rig, the computer can actually read my face. An advanced AI engine then basically interprets that into expressions. Now the computer can tell the digital puppet what to do. In effect, what's happening is it's the computer telling the muscles in the digital mic how to smile, talk, or do things. Now, the applications for a digital you could be enormous in health, education, and communication. So imagine your next Skype call to, I don't know, South Korea. I could be speaking fluent Korean in a suit, well, in reality, <laughs> unshaven in my pajamas at home, and I don't speak a word of Korean. 
Teams around the world in both public and private companies are working to solve this. Teams like Epic Games, whose tools you just saw, and teams like Pinscreen in LA, who are getting this to work on a mobile phone without any elaborate headgear. Okay, so here I am actually in uh, the offices of uh, Pinscreen, getting my face scanned, or rather actually just photographed on an iPhone, which uh, you know is great, don't get me wrong, I'm just used to bigger cameras. Uh, with more tech, not just one being held in someone's hand uh, with a Mickey Mouse back on it. Our ability to produce digital humans up until recently has been quite limited, but we're now seeing interactive digital humans starting to appear. The doors are opening, we are at an inflection point. We have this perfect storm of faster GPU graphics cards, new artificial intelligence deep learning algorithms, and great advances in game engines. It's an incredible combination of things coming together. This tremendous nexus of points is just providing us with an extraordinary opportunity of things that we can do. The important thing about this technology is that we can now use this to get these faces to work with us in real time. In other words, and this is a really key point, the faces that we're talking about can talk, interact, and see us. Now, as excited as I am about this technology, there are some major ethical issues at stake here. What does my choice of a digital agent say about me? Could a digital avatar actually compound self-image problems for some people? And where's trust in all of this if anyone can make a digital puppet of you? Well, first, the good news. The robo-apocalypse is like science fiction. We are like centuries off being able to come up with fully digital artificial intelligence. Even great work by companies in the robotics industry, such as Boston Dynamics, are not going to put a robot in your house anytime soon. Robots are very expensive. And while they have great applications in manufacturing, you're not going to have a lumbering great robot in your house, walk out the front door, go over to the car, get in, and drive you to work. The car will be the robot, and it's likely to have a smiling face on a screen to reassure you. OK, not that face. <laughs> but a face that you can talk to while it self-drives you to work. The biggest ethical issue is that face, the face that you choose to represent your technology and how you behave towards it. Now, you may think that it, your artificial agent is independent and it doesn't matter, and it could be anything, right? It just doesn't reflect, but it does. The fact that it's not human doesn't matter. For example, I'm under no illusion that my dog Shandy is a person. That's cute, huh? <laughs> but my behavior to my beloved Labrador just reflects my humanity. While conceptually and legally not a person, any cruelty to my dog would be horrifying to most people. Would sexist and demeaning behavior to a digital agent really be vastly less of an indictment because we said it's not a real person? You're going to judge me and how I behave to my digital assistant based on their race, their age, and their sex. What character traits would we ascribe to somebody who we discovered had, as their digital assistant, their mother? What about an archetypal butler or some anime schoolgirl? Who we choose to represent us, to serve us, really matters. And it just puts a whole new spin on the concept of what it is to be a user. Now we switch to the advent of new digital makeup, the ability to remove wrinkles, uh, age spots and birthmarks interactively. Does this advance the individual, or does it actually possibly reinforce stereotypes of perfection? Are we actually able to make somebody that is self-conscious actually recede further from real, the, the real life? And this misrepresentation extends to full impersonation. Deep fakes and AI face swapping technology now allows for believable face replacement. And this can be done in real time to a point that is undetectable to a normal eye. So if this is undetectable to a normal eye, then basically, like many other things, this centers around the key issue of trust. If I can be anyone and say anything, where's the trust? And the other side of that dilemma is how quickly we do trust these digital agents. Our research has shown that people, when they interact with their digital assistants, trust them. I mean, who doesn't trust their sat-nav or their Google Maps when it says turn left at the next intersection? If we defer even simple ideas and concepts 
to the wisdom of our AI computers, how does that characterize us? And doesn't that open us up to the, the bias in the deep learning data sets? We're trading agency for convenience with the owners and providers of these digital people. Our research also shows that even when we tell people the computers aren't smart, they're incredibly fast to believe the AI and trust the computer. Now, these are all really good ethical questions, and there are more. We're in an arms race to detect and spot fakes, a fast-moving, paced fight between those who would make the fakes and those who would try to preserve our trust. But all this technology, all this stuff that I've been talking about, can be used for good. I wish that my father had had a digital assistant so he could have helped connect with his grandchildren. My father came late to technology, but when he found his beloved computer, he talked to everyone around the world. Unfortunately, for the last five years of his life, this window has closed for my father. He had a stroke, and he's unable to form short-term memories. People like my father, I mean, he recognizes me. I mean, I've been in his life for years, but he can't connect to technology and to his grandchildren. He has, he just has this inability to learn new tech. He's shut in by the lack of his manual dexterity and his inability to adapt to technology. Really, when all is said and done, what I want to do is give people like my father, people that just don't have these things that we take for granted, more than just a helping hand. I want to give them a friendly face on their technology. Thank you. Thank you.